But I really do appreciate Harold and his introduction to Dr. Tom Thornton. But please help me welcome Harold Martin. Thank you, Jerry. <coughs> After that wonderful prayer and thinking we heard, I'm reminded of a cute little story. Uh, a pastor's wife was having his Sunday school children over to her yard for uh, the afternoon. And uh, while, while the kids were playing, she noticed three little boys climbing her cherry tree and stealing her cherries. She went running out there and says, do you know what the Bible says about thieves? One little boy perched up very proudly and said, I do, ma'am. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> I had the distinct pleasure of uh, working on a place names project with uh, Dr. Tom Thornton. In uh, 1993, uh, while working at the University of Alaska as a professor of anthropology, he came to the Southeast Native Subsistence Commission, which I was president of at the time, with a proposal to do a uh, Tinkered Place Names project. We had never thought about this before, and uh, uh, suddenly realized that uh, every time we lost uh, an elder, uh, a wealth of knowledge and history went with that elder, and none of it was documented. And uh, the project made a lot of sense. And uh, in 1994, the grant came through. We hired Dr. Tom Thornton to coordinate the project. And I, I administered the, uh, the grant. I, I did do some uh, did do some field work with uh, Dr. Tom Thornton. Uh, the first thing I had to do was uh, go through every native community in the Southeast and met with the tribal governments as well as the elders to get their permission to you know, do, uh, do this project. We couldn't just go in there and, and, and do whatever we wanted. We had to be very careful that we didn't uh, uh, go into in, in any sacred lands. We got a blessing from just about every community except one, but uh, we got around that, uh, they finally consented to do but there was a, a couple of communities that already had uh, their, some place name projects uh, well, well, well going well ahead. You know, there, uh, Sitka uh, had, had place names. And, uh, Dr. Tom Torrey just uh, worked with uh, Herman Kitka to, to finish that project. And uh, Puna Indian Association already had Glacier Bay covered. And uh, we just helped them work around, around the Glacier Bay. And, uh, we uh, got some opposition at the beginning. Uh, people were afraid that we'd be giving away our subsistence areas by uh, placing our things in these areas. But uh, we uh, told them that, you know, you, I think we're a little bit too late for that. You know, I think in the 17th century, when the first explorers came up here, they were already documenting their rivers. And if you go to any U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Game Department, uh, Coast Guard, they have every stream in Southeast serving. You know, they know what, what, uh, what uh, salmon hit those streams. But in the end, we uh, went around and presented the, uh, it wasn't a final project, it was by no means a, a, a final project. Uh, they were still collecting names and adding to the answers. <coughs> Dr. Tom Thornton uh, is currently currently the Director uh, of Environmental Change and Management at the School of uh, Ge Geographics and uh, Environment at uh, Oxford University in England. Please help me welcome Dr. Tom Stone.
Colonel Chiefs, thanks, Harold. Uh, can I invite you back just for a minute, just uh, at the risk of violating protocol? The theme for this conference is uh, Hasahu Hatsini, our, our names, our strength. And uh, since I've moved back to Ingnan Kwan, uh, to England, I've discovered my, some of my own tribe. And uh, it turns out that I come from, I have a lineage and I come from the uh, Chocolate House. Okay, <laughs> Chocolate House. And uh, I forgot how to say chocolate uh, in Clinkett. Somebody help me, but uh, cacao hit or something like that. Uh, but uh, I want to give, it, give you that and then... <laughs> we also, uh, in England, we put our, our names on our regalia and uh, place names are, are something that are, that are treasured and we put on our regalia. So uh, uh, there's this little campsite down on the Thames River that uh, my people, because uh, I am part English, uh, my people are very fond of. And they've had it since time immemorial uh, until the Romans came and dispossessed them and uh, renamed it Londinium, okay? But we have taken this little place back uh, and put, put the name on it and uh, made it part of our regalia. So, here you go, Harold. <laughs> London. <laughs> so I'm drawing new sources of strength from chocolate and from, uh, from our cities in London. Um, no, it's very, very humbling, very, uh, very much a pleasure to, to be here uh, talking on uh, on place names. I want to talk about some new topics um, and maybe revisit some old, um, but the title of my talk, Place Names and Socio-Ecological Resilience and Restoration, uh, sounds a bit complex, but I hope we can uh, uh, realize what it means together by the end of this talk. So, um, I actually, my roots in talking about place names go back to the first clan conference that Andy Hope organized and uh, in 1993, and uh, uh, one of the first essays I ever wrote was in the, the first uh, publication, Will the Time Ever Come, about names uh, and, and cultural resources in general and how, how you identify them. And uh, here it is, 2015, I'm still talking about names, so uh, I, I, I risk being called uh, maybe a one-trick pony, but uh, it's not true. I've gone on to other things, but uh, you find yourself always pulled back to uh, where the ground of being is, and certainly that is in place names. And I think uh, I've become more interested um, in them, not simply as individual entities, individual names, um, which you can look at as uh, artifacts or as um, eco-facts, meaning uh, they say things about the ecology of the land, but also as social facts. Um, and I become more interested in them as a, as a collective. You know, what do they mean when they're all arrayed together? What sorts of patterns do they show on the landscape? And, and uh, what can that tell us um, that's meaningful today and in the future about uh, how uh, we interact with this landscape, uh, Ha'ani or the Tongass National Forest, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the second line there, the, the collective uh, of, of names the uh, assemblages, uh, and I use the term uh, scapes, which is sort of the, uh, the interactional component, uh, and assemblages, which is the meaningful constellations of, of names that lie on the land. So, uh, but I'll go back to my very origins because I still draw a lot of strength from the elders that uh, taught me, and uh, in my very first Clinkett artifact I saw was actually, uh, you could call it a map of uh, a geographic site. And that was this uh, button blanket here in the middle that Mary Willis, um, the Deshi Tan uh, woman, showed me uh, because I was doing some research on Sitko Bay, which is a, a sockeye fishery and a traditional village site um, for, for the Deshi Tan. And um, she showed that to me, kind of like saying, this is our deed of trust, if you will. This, this shows that we, uh, we have this place, we care for this place. And uh, I ended up learning a lot from her and from her, her niece, uh, uh, 
uh, Lydia George. And uh, it was really Lydia George who um, inspired me to th think about something that's really quite remarkable in Clinkett, which is how well people have remembered names over generations and generations. Um, 10,000 years, if you believe the archaeology, maybe some of them are that old, maybe some of them are older. Um, but it's incredible to be able to remember that in an oral culture. Uh, and I asked the question, something like, well, how do you do it? And she said, well, you've got to realize that each name, each important name, has a, not only a name, but a story, a song, and a design that goes with it. And um, I ended up describing this as the, uh, the Clinkett, uh, Clinkett multimediacy. Uh, and uh, because it's uh, things you can see, like the blanket, things you can hear, like the song and the name itself, and then things that you literally can wear uh, as part of your own being, uh, again, like a blanket or, or a hat. And um, there's obviously great strength that's, that's drawn from that when you, uh, you literally wear the landscape and, uh, and, a, and a great sense of belonging that comes with that. And uh, for her, it was really, really obvious, and just she stated it so simply, I've never forgotten that, because I think it's, it's, it's quite important. Um, but obviously, there are other ways that you can hold places um, precious, and certainly one of those is by, by engaging it in terms of uh, your economy, the way you make a living. Um, and uh, that's been important uh, to my study of place names as well. Um, I still sometimes use the, one of the first maps I ever made uh, of Clinkett place names with, uh, with Lydia and uh, with her son, uh, Jimmy George, uh, that we ended up making kind of a talking map out of uh, that I thought would be a good illustration of this principle of Clinkett multimediacy. And it still shows a lot of the interesting patterns of names that, that are worth illustrating. Um, one of them is that not everything is named. Names aren't evenly distributed on the landscape. Uh, the names in Sitco Bay tend to be arrayed along the coast. Uh, coastal maritime people, that certainly makes sense. Uh, some places are quite densely named, and in Sitco Bay, those black circles represent the Clinkett named sites, and you'll see there's more of them than on the English name set. So there's a, a, more, a more precise um, uh, lens really to identify features on the landscape. And then certain things like sockeye creeks uh, tend to get, uh, cluster a lot of names around them, and they tend to be named for their most precious resources. So uh, Sitco Creek, um, which in, in English takes its name from Sitku, which is the name of the bay, which is, uh, relates to glaciers. Um, the name of the creek in Clinket is Gatini, which is uh, uh, Sockeye Creek, uh, Red Salmon Creek, and uh, that's a common name that you that you find. Um, but there's also a name for halibut in here for, that relates to halibut fishing sites. Uh, there are names for forts, which are common features uh, in Clinkett, um, and there's names for little lagoons, and that one in number six, if I remember correctly, uh, was called Yakchaku, which means uh, sea otter lagoon, so a uh, sense that sea otters were once present. Maybe they are again, I haven't, haven't been over there. But they weren't at the time that uh, I, I uh, documented this name. Um, so obviously they tell us quite a bit, and uh, if nothing else, they're, they're worth holding on to for that reason. Um, but these, some of these places, as you see, are reflected also on the map. So the place that Mary Willis wanted to show me and, and uh, ended up showing me when we went over there one time was this place called Yeskatuku, which is the Raven Cave, which is represented in all of those uh, blankets. And then uh, another important place is uh, Tinaguni, which is this uh, copper. Uh, it's represented there. It's a little clean water spring, uh, which has a story involving coppers that goes along with it. So, so these names did illustrate that principle that she was talking about in her own lineage and in her own family. And um, it was interesting to see in her memorial, which I was fortunate enough to attend in 2011, that a new house screen was brought out with these images on it um, uh, to, um, uh, 
to reconfirm those connections. Um, so to me, that was quite illustrative of really the major point I want to make today, that how places can be not only resident, but resilient, and how people uh, do hold them and cherish them uh, in uh, a number of different ways. Okay, now I want to switch gears a little bit and, and go back and take a global shot, and then I'm going to proceed to come all the way down into a few uh, named uh, landscapes. But one of my interests now is in, in what uh, place names can tell us about things like biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and uh, probably many people don't know what biodiversity means, but it simply means the diversity of life in the world. And uh, there's another concept called biocultural diversity, which refers to basically the total variety exhibited by all the world's natural and cultural systems. And what's important is that uh, in documenting biological and cultural diversity, uh, scientists have found that there's a correlation between the two, where you find high biological diversity, you find high cultural diversity. And that high cultural diversity tends to be in lands inhabited by indigenous peoples the world over. So even though they inhabit less than 20% of the Earth's surface, 70% um, more than 70% of the world's biodiversity exists on those lands. So that's something to cherish right there. But when you look at it from a global picture, um, you see some interesting patterns, but you see also some distortions. And um, in this figure here, um, if you can read the legend, basically um, the highest areas of biodiversity are in orange and red. And uh, these red areas uh, are also the highest in terms of cultural diversity. And cultural diversity is here measured by uh, linguistic diversity, uh, different religions, number of identified ethnic groups, uh, and so on. Um, and so you find that the, the tropics do dominate. So this is really Amazonia here. Uh, uh, Central Congo is, 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 is there. India and what's called the Indo-Malaysia, Melanesia Peninsula uh, has, has the greatest uh, biological and cultural diversity as measured by those proxies. Um, but in North America, it's all sort of one color because the way they did it was by country. But if you go into North America, which I'm going to do here, the Northwest Coast, interestingly, is one of the most diverse areas. Um, so in terms of linguistic diversity on the Northwest Coast, um, in this map, which was done by the Ecotrust people back when they were still called InfoRain, I think, um, they did a map of the status of, of languages and they mapped, um, I think it's 57 different languages in the Northwest Coast culture area, which starts at Southeast Alaska and Tlingit country and goes all the way down to California. Uh, and then they mapped that uh, in relation to the health of the forest, the health of the rainforest. And you see there basically that green is good uh, and red is bad. It means where, where the forest has been clear cut, basically. And uh, what they wanted to show was that there was a, a correlation between the health of the forest and the health of the indigenous languages. So uh, at that time, languages that appear in that, what color is that, chartreuse or whatever it is, uh, were the healthiest languages, but even, even they're not particularly healthy, but they had more than 100 speakers at that time, where uh, many of the ones in the southern end, where the forest had been uh, clear cut and so on, um, are, uh, are extinct. And of course, there's other reasons besides deforestation uh, for that pattern, but um, there seems to be a relationship in terms of health and well-being between the status of languages and the status of uh, the environment, perhaps as measured by old growth forest or as measured by uh, biodiversity. Um, and it's also been shown, I think there was a presentation yesterday by uh, Alice Taft that I listened to talking about uh, relationships between language loss and health uh, declines and so on. Um, I think you can see that relationship uh, certainly in, in these graphs as well, but uh, they've, they've developed uh, two terms that uh, describe this, uh, uh, a language and a forest or a, a habitat that's in good shape uh, exhibits what's called eco-cultural health and uh, 
an, an environment and language that's not in good shape tend to signal what's called ecocultural distress syndrome. So uh, certainly worth, worth recognizing that. Um, so when you look at Southeast Alaska and uh, the array of place names, um, I use the opportunity of, being, of having a master's student come to me who was in our biodiversity and conservation and management program. And she was interested in doing something with GIS and looking at biocultural diversity. And so I talked her into looking at this uh, data set of Clinkett names and plotting it against some interesting variables, uh, some interesting ecological data, and seeing what sorts of uh, correlations uh, she could find. And so she, um, she identified a number of variables of data that she could get relatively easily, and I helped her get the data. But the ones in capital letters, including the, the Clinkett Place Name database, um, the anadromous fish catalog, which tells you where all the salmon streams are in southeast Alaska, hydrography, uh, marine mammal, call-outs, concentration sites, bird wintering areas, and so on. All those ones in capital letters showed at least uh, some significant correlations with densities of place names, okay? So in other words, you find densities of place names where you have salmon streams, where you have concentrations of marine mammals and birds, where you have uh, slightly warmer mean temperatures, uh, particularly in the months of January, July, May, and October. Uh, where you have a higher degree of uh, what's called NDVI, which is a, a gross measure of vegetation, basically terrestrial vegetation. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, I added the last one there, which she didn't measure, but you also have a basic correspondence of higher densities of place names where you have higher population densities. Okay? More people, I guess, to name things. So anyway, that was interesting. Um, and so, and a lot of these are biotic, what you'd call biotic factors, but they probably don't surprise you uh, because you already knew that salmon streams are important. Uh, but it's interesting to see it um, demonstrated statistically. And, uh, and then there are some abiotic factors which obviously make a difference. Probably the most important one that she found in the limited set of variables that she looked at was, was slope. Uh, and so obviously where you have very steep slopes, even where uh, at lower elevations you don't find um, as much uh, habitation uh, sites, and so uh, you find fewer, fewer names, okay? And so this is represented here on these maps, and so the blue here is basically just concentrations of um, maps, and I didn't label the towns or anything, but uh, basically you see that most of the uh, region is covered in, in these blue uh, lines. But uh, probably the heaviest was, was here around Sitka Sound in this map. But this map is also missing some of the name sets around Ketchikan. So um, that was just an artifact of the sample she used. OK, now I wanted to talk a little bit about ecosystem services, because I think it's not only resources that you need to look at, things like salmon and seals and so on, but also what are called ecosystem services. And uh, I've been interested in this concept um, that was first advanced about 15 years ago in something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was trying to, uh, you might say, give us a broader set of tools to value the environment. Uh, and so one of the concepts that they said was we can't just value the environment as a set of resources. We must also think of it as services. So just like in an economy, you have goods and services, in nature, you have goods, which could be your fish or your game, whatever, but you also have services. And those services, um, as they defined them, are provisioning services. It's in the far right. So I find I can't talk in the microphone, point and read at the same time. Uh, but things like food, fresh water, fuel, wood, fiber, so on. Regulating services, things like climate, disease, water purification, pollination. Um, Cultural services, which is basically anything having to do with culture, could be subsistence, recreation, spiritual, religious, and so on. And uh, in this article that I published with one of my um, graduate students who works in Amazonia, we sort of uh, accepted what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment has told us. That's the uh, hard one. Oh, this one? Uh, is that I think. 
Yeah. Or is that being recorded? I don't know. That's okay. I'll, yeah. Yeah. Um, we sort of said, let's add another side to it, because one of the things you find certainly in indigenous cultures in the Amazon, uh, in the Northwest Coast, and elsewhere, is it's not just that people are valuing nature for its goods and services, but they're also cultivating those goods and services in nature. So they're helping nature maintain its productivity by caring for it. And uh, you find this pattern in the Amazon, and it's now well documented that, that a lot of the biodiversity that you find in places like the Amazon forest are not simply a result of there being no people there. It's actually a result of people interacting with the forest and actually increasing the biodiversity through their, their co-evolved practices with animals and plants that inhabit that environment. So we created another whole side to this scheme where you think about services to ecosystems, S2E as it were, and these include things like protecting and defending uh, those goods and services that exist in your environment, uh, taking steps to enhance them, uh, whether that's through techniques of cultivation, uh, uh, transplantation, weeding, what have you, uh, and then restoration, doing things to restore ecosystems that have become degraded. These are all things that human societies, uh, particularly indigenous societies, are engaged in. Um, so what does this have to do with place names? Well, um, one of the things I wondered was, do you find this practice of servicing ecosystems in what we would call place name hotspots? areas where you find high densities of place names. People have invested uh, thought and effort to put names on the land. It's obviously a sign of, of not only um, interest, but also of activity. Um, so I'll go through this and I'll illustrate this concept with one or, one or two landscapes. Um, but this is a map we made with the help of um, the Forest Service, uh, uh, who. Uh, uh, this is a joint project with uh, the U.S. Forest Service and with uh, Portland State, my former university. And it was to, to just take the uh, place name data that we had documented in the SENSE project and, and through some subsequent work and uh, array those names simply as dots on the region, throughout the region, and then uh, use a, a kind of spatial analysis tool to see where they cluster and then to uh, kind of color it. So you could just look at it and you see here that where it's more orange, basically, are areas of high place name density. So we can, we can call these place name hotspots uh, using that, that language that comes out of biodiversity. So um, pretty much they correspond to population centers. If I put this next one on, I take, take all the dots off but leave the heat maps. Um, I put a graduated set of dots on based on historic populations, and this is a bit of a distortion because most of your uh, statistics on historical populations come after things like smallpox epidemics and so on. Um, <laughs> so for example, down here, you, you have a population for, for Saxman that comes in, uh, I, when I looked up uh, the population records, there were a few, but it's just, I think it's under 200 people. But obviously there were villages all around, and uh, one of the tasks would be to match these up with the historic villages we know about, but that go all the way around Beam Canal and probably would closely correspond with those hotspots. But in other places it makes sense, like around Sitka, which is one of the, the areas that, that, that proved to be a very high density hotspot, the historical population in Sitka was very high. In fact, it's, the, I think, the highest population on the islands. Um, and uh, the place name densities reflect that. Uh, an area where you, you suspect that our, something's wrong is in Wrangell, because we know there were high uh, popula population densities in Wrangell, but we simply didn't capture that many names in the place name survey, because unfortunately there were not many speakers left from Wrangell when we documented names, and so we have some, but uh, it, it should be a much more orange and hotter uh, spot, but it does, it does show up. Um, but Chilkat area, uh, you see high, high correspondence, but it's obviously the, the density is uh, marked around the river uh, in particular. Uh, Huna, you see it, Yakutat, and uh, Dry Bay comes up a little bit, and uh, Latuya Bay 
uh, although I forgot to put the dot in the Tuya Bay. So there, that shows you the basic correspondence between population density and, uh, and uh, place name density. Um, okay, then I want to move on to uh, showing some key resources. So I mentioned uh, sockeye before, and what we've done here is simply take the uh, anadromous fish stream catalog, which is a, a database that's maintained by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, projected it in blue, but only streams that include uh, sockeye and king salmon, right? And so the question is, you know, do those streams which show evidence of both sockeye and king salmon, how do they match up with, uh, with these place name hotspots? And again, you see there is a pretty good correspondence. Of course, you, uh, in the anadromous fish catalog, the, uh, the streams run all the way up into the interior, but of course the names are, are um, clustered down by the coast. Uh, but if you, if you put all of these uh, streams that have both evidence of sockeye and king, uh, if you put them as dots down just along the coast, there would be an even higher uh, overlap. Uh, so most of those areas are covered, uh, with a few interesting exceptions. And again, the Wrangell area and the Sum Sumdum uh, area, Sao Dan, uh, show, uh, show that pattern. Um, then another idea is that we can look at so-called cultural keystone species and biological keystone species as kinds of proxies for ecosystem services. Um, so, what's a biological keystone species? Well, it's a species that's considered very uh, critical to the structure and the functioning of an ecosystem. Okay? So, certainly anadromous fish, would, most anadromous fish would fit that category, particularly something like sockeye. But they also um, are, uh, are uh, important for providing ecosystem services. Okay? And uh, so one of the, one of the ones uh, I, th I looked at and I think is quite interesting is uh, herring. Because we know herring is uh, a very important species in the food chain. This uh, little pie chart there shows how much of the diet of all these various species comes from herring. And it's uh, over 50% for uh, some of the salmon. Was it uh, Chinook? It's 62%. Uh, Cod, 71%. Uh, so forth and so on. So uh, no, no less an expert than Harold Martin said, it's the feed for everything. Do you remember that uh, quote? It was a different project. <laughs> uh, so it's critical to the uh, marine food chain. And then there's also a concept called cultural keystone species, which um, doesn't necessarily have to also be a biological keystone species, but it's one that's keystone to cultural survival. Uh, and that uh, includes, these types of species rather include ones that are intensely cultivated, uh, are, are um, uh, used for a multiplicity of things, tend to have rich linguistic associations, rich cultural associations, uh, persistence in memory and use despite cultural change, unique and irreplaceable role in the socio-ecological system, and uh, a relatively high exchange value in providing opportunities for resource acquisition beyond the home territory. And certainly that's true of herring, uh, particularly in uh, areas where it's found in abundance, like Sitka Sound. And so uh, as an example, I have the, this photo that uh, I took a long time ago of Al Perkins, Kiksadi, uh, in the, in the, uh, the herring rock robe, uh, Yao Tei. So that's a suggestion that, that herring is a cultural keystone species. And it's, uh, of course, very important in the spring harvest, um, particularly the eggs and the, uh, the eggs on kelp and eggs on branches, which are widely traded. So we can, we can take a species like herring, which is both a biological keystone species and a cultural keystone species, and look at some of the uh, traditional knowledge about where it occurs. Uh, and these are um, spawning areas uh, overlaid here. Uh, I think we did, we did uh, two forage fish at the same time. So the blue is streams that show uh, hooligan spawning and uh, another important forage fish. And uh, the pink areas are spawning areas we documented in the herring synthesis project. 
And again, you see a lot of overlap with the heat maps. Um, you can't see all of them, uh, but again, the Ketchikan area shows a high degree of correspondence, as does the Sitka area. Um, and then in other areas, like Kluckwan, the hooligan obviously shows up as being more important than the herring, because it's more abundant uh, in those places. Same thing with uh, Yakutat and Dry Bay areas. Uh, okay. Now, if you focus in on this more closely, this is going into Sitka Sound, and I've changed the map here. Just I took this map from, uh, from the book, uh, the Atlas, and uh, it's one of the most densely named areas anywhere in southeast Alaska. So this is Sitka Sound. And of course, this is the site of a lot of contestation today between the commercial herring sacro fishers uh, and the subsistence um, herring egg harvesters. And uh, there's been a lot of jockeying for who's going to get what's left uh, of these herring as their spawning area has shrunk uh, over the past, uh, well, really the past century, but especially in the last 50 years. And uh, they're down to trying to close certain areas off so that they would be restricted from commercial fishing and protected for subsistence use. And uh, as part of that uh, effort, the Sitka tribe was quite interested in using some of this traditional knowledge that had been gathered, including on place names, to, to uh, try to show uh, why these areas were important and, um, and why it might be beneficial to maintain them in their, uh, so we say, their aboriginal state. And so um, after having documented the names, I went back and looked at names that referred directly to herring. And uh, of course, there, there are about a half a dozen, well actually, I guess there's eight listed on the side here. And, uh, one of the things you have to realize is not all of them are direct references. So you can't just look at the name set and say, okay, I'll search on herring and uh, I'll find all the important herring sites. No, if you, um, never mind the name, but if, if you have, uh, look here just at the translations, uh, herring only appears in a few of them. And then you have these marvelous ones like uh, which is looking milky straight Okay, which is referring to the spawn itself, the milky white spawn, uh, where it just begins. Uh, and you know, if you were searching on herring, that wouldn't come up, but anyone who looked at it would know, oh, okay, that's a reference to herring spawning. Um, but the caution I would make is don't look too closely just at any of the individual names, but look at the whole array. I mean, what's important here is the density of names that are occurring in Sitka Sound. And if we remember that herring is a keystone species, it's not just that herring are present, but they're drawing in everything else that eats them uh, at the same time. And so lots of references are to those other species as well. And so the whole uh, tan and tanda is a reference to jumping fish. And those are fish that are feeding on herring, uh, herring that are escaping other fish, uh, and all this mayhem that occurs around uh, this place called Middle Island in, uh, in Sitka Sound. Um, so you can go beyond just names, uh, and uh, in the, uh, in the uh, atlas, um, we did a map of the Salmon Boy story, at least the version that Swanton recorded in Sitka. And um, I think there's at least uh, a dozen, I think 16 names that are referenced within Sitka Sound that belong to that story where, if you know the story, the, the boy is, um, insults uh, the dry fish um, that his mother uh, gives him from last season and is captured by the salmon, taken away and transformed into a salmon, and then uh, ends up returning to spawn in the same stream, uh, only to be uh, uh, caught by his own parents, uh, who then have to transform him back. Um, you also have the stories associated with Herring Rock um, that are there, and also um, the Kagwan San story about uh, uh, the giant brown bear which uh, attacked the settlement at Halleck Island uh, when they were producing herring oil, which used to be an activity at that site. So uh, 
again, the biodiversity and the cultural significance of the site is not simply in the names, but sometimes the connections between the names that are in things like storylines. And so again, in Sitka Sound, you have, these are three, but you've got many more. Okay, so this is the map that, um, that Harvey uh, Kitka and I made, because Harvey was the, the uh, chairman, I think he still is, of the Herring Committee uh, for the Sitka Tribe of Alaska. And um, as I said, they were fighting over this uh, little square here, trying to get this area, and there's Middle Island, uh, and there's Herring Rock, where it used to be before it was dynamited to make room for the Sheffield Hotel, which is now uh, uh, near the A&B Hall. Um, they were trying to get a proposal to close this off, and uh, it was opposed by the commercial fishermen, in part because they don't want to be limited to where they can go, because the herring move around, and if the herring go in that, uh, in that space, they want to be, be able to go in there and fish it. And their argument is, well, we have a quota, and as long as we stay within our quota, there's going to be enough herring left to spawn. But the, um, the Sitka tribe disputes that, and they, they uh, part of what they dispute is, is the fact that there's actually a pattern to the way the herring come in uh, to spawn, and this area around, particularly between Herring Rock and Middle Island, is very important because the herring come in on either side of it, they, they lay low in these troughs, these deep water troughs, and then uh, they come up to spawn and they come along the shoreline and sort of pick their spaces where they're going to spawn. <coughs> and then they begin to do it. And people are sensitive to that. And they begin, they begin to cultivate the herring by laying the branches and the substrate, uh, essentially inviting the herring to come in and spawn. And obviously having a major uh, seine boat uh, sacro fishery in the middle of all of that uh, causes, can cause havoc. Um, but other than documenting that, which I think was fairly straightforward, we um, made an effort using sort of the density of names and also what we had collected about areas where people had laid branches to certainly ask how much of this traditional seascape was actually under cultivation by Sitka Clinkets when there was a very vital herring fishery there. In other words, where were people regularly going and putting branches in Sitka Sound? And you find that it's actually a much wider area uh, all the way down to what's called Dorothy Narrows below Redoubt Bay and then all the way up uh, above Halleck Island up towards Neva Strait. Um, that was area that was regularly cultivated, considered very reliable year after year as a place to uh, collect herring eggs. So it's not that different in size from the contemporary commercial fisheries management area, but um, the fact is now most people have to lay their branches here because on, the only reliable areas are, are, are now in this, in this place. It's not to say that herring won't spawn outside of it, but it's uh, uh, not reliable. So one of the uh, ideas here is this was the productivity of Sitka Sound was partly a result of people servicing ecosystems, to come back to that language that I introduced before. So people were uh, essentially abiding by spawning protocols, uh, uh, waiting for herring to come in, find their way into the sound, and then beginning to lay their branches, uh, extending the habitat uh, where herring could lay their branches by essentially moving out from that central area around Herring Rock and laying branches all the way down to Northy Narrows and up toward Neva Strait, and doing it on a regular basis in such a way that they were not only protecting the habitat but actually cultivating it to increase the, uh, the area for herring to spawn on. And then if you combine that with the fact that they were actually selectively harvesting the eggs, that is to say they weren't picking up all of the branches that they laid or they were putting some branches back that had thin, thin eggs or that they thought would survive if they were put back in the water, um, you have uh, and this other technique of transplantation where they would take some eggs and move them to again to extend the area of productivity, you, uh, you can argue um, that the cultivation activities actually enhance the, ha the uh, habitat and the product productivity of the herring fishery and reduce the vulnerabilities of that fishery, probably increasing its resilience 
and more than likely offsetting any impact of the harvest itself. Uh, so it's a case where you can potentially have your cake and eat it too, or have your eggs and cultivate them too, uh, if you follow the right protocols. And uh, so this is a pattern I think that's available only if you start with looking at the names as hotspots, then you begin to interrogate those names, find out what they mean, and then gather some traditional knowledge about how people used and maintained uh, these areas. And I suspect that other places, not just for herring or hooligan, but other places where you have these high densities of place names are also habitats under cultivation where people were not only valuing goods and services produced by the ecosystem, but actually maintaining it either intentionally or in, in other ways um, at, at uh, what arguably could be a higher level of productivity than it would have um, in its so-called natural state. Okay. Um, so I want to caution about doing too much with this because it's like anything else. If you only concentrate on the really hot spots, there's a danger that you will neglect uh, the not so hot spots or the, or the spots that don't come out as, uh, as, uh, as orange uh, in this map. And uh, a little place like Sitco Bay uh, does show up as orange, but it's obviously not as hot as some other areas. But yet, for uh, a certain group of people, it's a very, very important site. So um, I'm not advocating that we only protect these hot spots, but uh, I think it's certainly, uh, it's certainly a good place to start. All right, we did a couple more of these, but I won't uh, say too much about these. Uh, this is one with harbor seals. Uh, and again, you've got the historic population centers, you've got the place name densities, and then um, you've got concentrations of, uh, of harbor seal kills. Sorry, uh, the graduated dots here are, are harbor seal kill sites. Okay, so uh, the heavy seal harvesting areas are in Yakutat and uh, Huna. Um, and I put a red circle there indicating a void because the other place that's mentioned historically as, as having a high reliance on seals was uh, Sao Don Quan. Uh, and that's an area that was depopulated very early and we don't have many names in that area. It's also an area that's, that's undergone significant environmental change. Um, but they were evidently quite reliant on, on seal hunting. But maybe some of it has been transferred uh, to uh, to cake, um, this is some of those people are there where there still is a, a significant reliance on seals. So again, you can uh, interrogate it both ways. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think it's interesting to look at land selections, okay? Because uh, one of the things you have to say right off the bat about most of these places is they're not under the present ownership of Tlingit tribes and clans as they once were. Um, but there is obviously some ownership over sites, but the, the bulk of it lies with Alaska Native corporations. And so it's interesting, for example, to, to look at place name hotspots versus lands that have been selected and conveyed to uh, Alaska Native corporations since uh, ANCSA was passed in 1971. And um, this is only the, um, the, the main area selected. It doesn't include um, so-called historic sites. Um, but if you look at where the historic site hotspots are, and I didn't put that up here for a reason, but I also don't have all the data, um, you would see that most of the historic sites are in areas that are also place name hotspots. But with the areas selected by corporations, it varies because first of all, Alaska Native corporations were quite limited in where they could select lands. So for example, around Sitka Sound, which is as we've just dis discovered as a super hot spot, uh, uh, you have very little uh, land that was selected by corporations. And uh, that's a function of the fact that the city, the city claimed the land and they weren't eligible to select land uh, in that area. And uh, had to select it actually across at Cube Cove, which led to a, a major lawsuit with uh, Angoon, among other things. Um, and then you see a lot of land was selected both by the regional and the village corporations 
down on southern Prince of Wales Island, and uh, that's certainly a function of high value timber uh, in, the, in those selections. Um, so uh, that, but it might, may have also been an area, excuse me, uh, uh, an effort to avoid uh, hot spots that had values in traditional culture. So a lot of the areas that were selected are actually on the edge or even outside of hot spots. Um, not around Huna, though, unfortunately. Okay, so anyway, that's uh, just something to think about. And a lot of the, uh, the mismatch there, I think, is, is basically the constraints of ANXA itself and what people, how much land people could select and where they could select that land, as well as what they selected it for, commercial development or protection of historic sites. Okay, so c to conclude, um, place names are not evenly distributed. Uh, their dense clusters reflect what I've been calling biocultural hotspots. Uh, I think there's utility in looking at them at bo and the uh, ecological and cultural dynamics that underlie these so-called hotspots to try to understand how they evolved, why they diversified and became niches or hotspots in the first place, and how resilient or not resilient they have been uh, as Aboriginal socio-ecological systems, and to do this at the landscape scale. So that is to say, not for each individual named place, but for clusters uh, of places that have meaning as scapes, landscapes and seascapes. Um, I think this in turn has a lot of relevance for contemporary management of these landscapes and the natural and cultural resources and the services, cultural ecosystem services uh, that they contain. Um, it's interesting to look at the gaps uh, in the articulation between the social and the ecological data because they suggest areas for further research. Um, why do some places that, for example, look like hotspots for salmon not have high densities of place names? Is it because there's missing data from toponymic loss? Is it because of abiotic factors like the geography itself or the slope? Or is it because of environmental change? Um, or is it because of degradation of some kind? And in the latter case, uh, there's obviously great poten potential for restoration. Um, and we see that again in Sitka Sound. Um, Silver Bay, if you know Silver Bay, south of Sitka, is actually named for herring. Uh, and the fact that the, the silver darlings, as they call them in England, uh, were so abundant there that the, the bay turned silver. And obviously when it was developed as a pulp mill site, uh, a lot of havoc was wreaked on that uh, herring spawning habitat, but also just the wintering areas, everything. And so uh, that kind of knocked out that southern end of Sitka Sound as a biodiversity hotspot in many ways. But uh, the pulp mill is now almost 20 years gone, and that area is recovering. And uh, there are people in Sitka who are engaging in transplantation of herring eggs, taking them back to places they know were productive in the past, and essentially trying to, uh, to restore those, uh, those habitats. Uh, so that's certainly encouraging, and I think um, where they're doing it, as far as I know, I know only a couple of people who are doing this, um, they are doing it in areas that are suggested by the analysis that uh, I showed you in Sitka Sound. Um, so anyway, I, see, I think there's some potential there for, for management. And finally, I think um, looking at place names this way, it, it really does add a whole other perspective on land use and coastal zone management. Uh, and it's, it's a perspective that's not in uh, current GIS layers. Most land use managers, when they look at, look at the layers and they're making land use decisions, do not have this data at their disposal. And uh, so I would argue that they're a bit disoriented. They're a bit handicapped by not having access to this and not communicating with people who know how to interpret it, um, as, as I did with Harvey Kitka uh, after the Herring study, looking at, uh, looking at Sitka Sound. And uh, so I think by restoring these place names at this level and looking at them as at the regional level and at the landscape scale, there's great potential for restoring them in to their rightful place as, uh, as resilient, resonant, and uh, rightful artifacts 
ecofacts and meaningful pieces of culture on the land. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will take questions. I just want to uh, make sure I do the thank yous to, uh, to uh, all of the uh, people who helped out. Uh, a couple of them are here um, that I'd like to recognize, including uh, Eric Johnson. And is Gary here, too? Is, no, okay. Eric Johnson from the Forest Service, who helped print uh, all of those maps on the wall, which, which we created in Oxford and then sent uh, to him uh, to produce. And he made them look very nice. But a lot of what I've just showed is, uh, is on those maps. And uh, I would be quite happy for people, if, if at their leisure, to look at them. And if they want to make comments uh, on them, to uh, talk to me or, uh, or even write on them, if you want. Uh, uh, how come you don't have my spot here? Or uh, what's, what's, what's missing here? Or protect this place, or whatever. Um, but it would be nice to get some feedback on this concept, because we're trying to see whether the concept is worth uh, pursuing at any level. Um, so anyway, thanks to, thanks to them for, uh, for getting the printing done on a short notice and to uh, all of these other organizations, but particularly the Southeast Native Subsistence Commission where this all started with Harold. I have an announcement or two before I call on, on people for questions. I know we have David Keswick is going to ask one and I see somebody else had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I'll have David Keswick first here. But the, uh, the announcement, Shirley Kendall, she had uh, previously moved her presentation from yesterday morning. And we'll have it this, this morning at 11 o'clock. Her presentation is Anatomy of Making an Octopus Bay. And that'll be at 11 o'clock in the evening room. Don't forget we have vendors, uh, books, and then the weavers out in the hall too. David Kensick, you have a question? Uh, thanks, Tom. I just wanted to uh, ask a question with respect to the interior Tlingit community, if they're going to be considered, because that's part of our history mm -hmm. as a people. There are Tlingit names in the interior. And then the other one was with respect to the salmon, where you talked about the uh, king salmon and the sockeye. Uh, making certain places hot spots and so forth. And that is a result of having the high quality water mm. where those particular species can, can reproduce. And this is part of the reason, the reason I'm suggesting consideration of this is because the educational institutions do not believe that we have a science that we knew about hydrology, and that we knew about the uh, ecology and the environment. And the reason, and I'm certain you're aware of the house name in, in, in the Taku area, as well as over in the Angun area, that Ishki hit, mm. uh, the, the place where the salmon uh, gathered, which had to deal with the spring water. Mm. that has more oxygen in the water than, than all the other water and because of its temperature, because it's cold. And that's part of the re primary reason that I heard when our people were coming into this area here. An uh, eagle was leading them, and the eagle led them to where water was, where the water was good. And so you have a history hit in, our, in the history of the Tlingit people. And the reason there were salmon there is basically because it was really, really um, good water. Mm -hmm. But I think this is really what you're doing. I'm just making a suggestion. I think this is really, really great. It's good, good material. And the reputation that you have will help us to be able to probably convince some of the others that our people have knowledge of science. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, very important because people don't think, uh, they think we just settled there because of it. We settled there because of the knowledge. You mentioned the house of the uh, Akkash team. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that. We know that that's a powerful story from the, from the uh, Kiksani 
So just some consideration, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I think the things that you, you show is great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and that actually, you raise a good point about the uh, ish, because it's uh, it shows up as a place name, but it's also a concept. So it's almost like a generic concept that has to do with both hydrology, hyd hydrology, as I understood it, a place where salmon can fill in as they're going upstream and avoid the worst of the currents and so on. But you also mentioned purification, which is another ecosystem service but it's not one I'd heard in connection with that. So to me, that's just the kind of conversation you want to be having uh, about the management of these, of these sites and uh, the fact that, that Clinkets have this concept of ish, which is you know, not just a specific name of a place, but also a general scientific concept, if you will, uh, or ecological concept. I think there are others like that uh, as well, um, including the idea of the lagoon, like the, the aku, um, and these are really special environments that are noted in the language, but we don't necessarily know all that they signify in terms of, to use this language, their ecosystem services, what they do to enhance the ecosystem. So I think that's, that's a really good example of uh, where this research could go and, uh, and shed more light. Hi. Now, but you, I don't know if you really looked at that because that's an area right now that uh, has some extensive uh, logging. Uh, Is that it there? Again, other some of it's happening. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of logging. I don't know what um, has been done in terms of trying to understand the bioculture diversity of this particular place. Yeah. yeah. Am I pointing to the right area? I'm distorted, but I think that's the area you're talking about. Yeah, it is. It, it, it does show up, as particularly the uh, east side of it, as a hot spot area. And uh, we have a particular anthropologist and, and set of uh, consultants to thank for that. That, that. that information comes from Thomas Waterman's uh, name set that was recorded in 1922 with uh, just a couple of elders from Ketchikan. And together, in a week or so, they documented 956 names. <laughs> and uh, we could not have done that in Ketchikan. There would not have been that level of knowledge. Um, but that is what covers all of this area, including the Cleveland, the lower part of the Cleveland Peninsula. So uh, yeah, so I think there's, there is information in the, in the name set about that. I don't know all the names there, so one would have to look. Um. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Bill Martin, and I just have a couple of quick questions. One is that the trying to do long distance transplantation, and the second one is uh, the process of getting the name changed back to the Quinta name, because there was one place on the lower part of Cuyu or the lower part of Prince of Wales that carries my mother's name, and I kind of like to see if you can go through a process of change that. Yeah, um, on the transplantation question, um, yes, some of the transplantations that uh, I'm aware of were relatively long distance. In Sitka Sound, it was more extending the habitat, but um, in, the in the study we did on herring, uh, you have well-known stories of uh, people from Heidelberg coming up to uh, Craig Cloak area and transplanting herring down to Heidelberg so that they could start their own herring spawn uh, in that area. So that was that was some distance. And with salmon, you have um, documented uh, uh, again in Sitka with the Kitka family, Frank Kitka and uh, Herman Kitka. Uh, they wanted to have uh, good fall dog salmon, uh, and this is an important one too, because if you put up all the dog salmon streams, 
from the anadromous fish catalog, you find out that dog salmon are everywhere, and so it doesn't really match up with the place name hotspots. But if you took fall dog salmon streams, ones that are really good for fall dogs, it would, it would match up. Um, but anyway, they wanted to move a fall dog salmon run from Excursion Inlet to uh, Deep Bay, you know where Deep Bay is, north of Sitka. Uh, so that was quite a long distance, uh, and they, um, they did that. And uh, I recently, because Herman, Herman Kitka described the whole process of how they did that, and I published that in an, in a, in an essay recently in the, in the journal Human Ecology. But uh, there's other evidence of it as well, but I think his account is perhaps the most detailed of how it was done.